Part Two, Chapter Six of To Let. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Evers. The Foresight Saga Three, To Let by John Galsworthy. Part Two, Chapter Six, Soames' Private Life. On his way to Green Street, it occurred to Soames that he ought to go into Dumatrius in Suffolk Street about the possibility of the Boulderby Old Chrome. Almost worth while to have fought the war to have the Boulderby Old Chrome, as it were, in flux. Old Boulderby had died. His son and grandson had been killed. A cousin was coming into the estate, who meant to sell it. Some said because of the condition of England. Others said because he had asthma. If Dumatrius once got hold of it, the price would become prohibitive. It was necessary for Soames to find out whether Dumatrius had got it, before he tried to get it himself. He therefore confined himself to discussing with Dumatrius whether Monticellis would come again, now that it was the fashion for a pitcher to be anything except a pitcher, and the future of John's, with a side-slip into Buxton Knights. It was only when leaving that he added, "'So they're not selling the Boulderby old chrome, after all?' In sheer pride of racial superiority, as he had calculated would be the case, Dumatrius replied, "'Oh, I shall get it, Mr. Forsyth, sir.' The flutter of his eyelid fortified Soames in a resolution to write direct to the new Boulderby, suggesting that the only dignified way of dealing with an old chrome was to avoid dealers. He therefore said, "'Well, good day.' and went, leaving Dumatrius the wiser. At Green Street he found that Fleur was out, and would be all the evening. She was staying one more night in London. He cabbed on dejectedly, and caught his train. He reached his house about six o'clock. The air was heavy, midges biting, thunder about. Taking his letters, he went up to his dressing-room to cleanse himself of London. An uninteresting post. A receipt, a bill for purchases on behalf of Fleur, a circular about an exhibition of etchings. A letter beginning, Sir, I feel it my duty. That would be an appeal or something unpleasant. He looked at once for the signature. There was none. Incredulously, he turned the page over and examined each corner. Not being a public man, Soames had never yet had an anonymous letter, and his first impulse was to tear it up as a dangerous thing, his second to read it as a thing still more dangerous. Sir, I feel it my duty to inform you that having no interest in the matter, your lady is carrying on with a foreigner. Reaching that word, Soames stopped mechanically and examined the postmark. So far as he could pierce the impenetrable disguise in which the post office had wrapped it, there was something with a C, S, E, A, at the end, and a T in it. Chelsea? No. Battersea? Perhaps. He read on. These foreigners are all the same. Sack the lot. This one meets your lady twice a week. I know it of my own knowledge. And to see an Englishman put on goes against the grain. You watch it, and see if what I say isn't true. I shouldn't meddle if it wasn't a dirty foreigner that's in it. Yours obedient. The sensation with which Soames dropped the letter was similar to that he would have entering his bedroom and finding it full of black beetles. The meanness of anonymity gave a shuddering obscenity to the moment. And the worst of it was that this shadow had been at the back of his mind ever since the Sunday evening when Fleur had pointed down at Prosper Profond strolling on the lawn and said, Prowling cat! Had he not in connection therewith this very day perused his will a marriage settlement? And now this anonymous ruffian, with nothing to gain, apparently, save the venting of his spite against foreigners, had wrenched it out of the obscurity in which he had hoped and wished it would remain. To have such knowledge forced on him at this time of life about Fleur's mother, he picked the letter up from the carpet, tore it across, and then, when it hung together by just the fold at the back, stopped tearing, and re-read it. 
he was taking at that moment one of the decisive resolutions of his life. He would not be forced into another scandal. No. However he decided to deal with this matter, and it required the most far-sighted and careful consideration, he would do nothing that might injure Fleur. That resolution taken, his mind answered the helm again, and he made his ablutions. His hands trembled as he dried them. Scandal he would not have, but something must be done to stop this sort of thing. He went into his wife's room, and stood looking around him. The idea of searching for anything which would incriminate and entitle him to hold a menace over her did not even come to him. There would be nothing. She was much too practical. The idea of having her watched had been dismissed before it came. Too well he remembered his previous experience of that. No, he had nothing but this torn-up letter from some anonymous ruffian whose impudent intrusion into his private life he so violently resented. It was repugnant to him to make use of it, but he might have to. What a mercy if Fleur was not at home to-night! A tap on the door broke up his painful cogitations. Uh, Mr. Michael Mont, sir, is in the drawing-room. Will you see him? No, said Soames. Uh, yes, I'll come down. Anything that would take his mind off for a few minutes. Michael Mont, in flannels, stood on the veranda, smoking a cigarette. He threw it away as Soames came up, and ran his hand through his hair. Soames, feeling towards this young man, was singular. He was no doubt a rackety, irresponsible young fellow, according to old standards. Yet somehow likeable, with his extraordinarily cheerful way of blurting out his opinions. "'Come in,' he said. "'Have you had tea?' Mont came in. "'I thought Fleur would have been back, sir, but I'm glad she isn't. The fact is, I, I'm fearfully gone on her. So fearfully gone that I thought you'd better know. It's old-fashioned, of course, coming to father's first, but I thought you'd forgive that. I went to my own dad, and he says if I settle down he'll see me through. He rather cottons to the idea, in fact. I told him about your Goya. Oh, said Soames, inexpressibly dry. He rather cottons? Uh, yes, sir, do you? Soames smiled faintly. Y you see, resumed Mont, twiddling his straw hat, while his hair, ears, eyebrows, all seemed to stand up from excitement. When you've been through the war, you can't help being in a hurry. To get married and unmarried afterward, said Soames slowly. Uh, not from Fleur, sir. Imagine if you were me. Soames cleared his throat. That way of putting it was forcible enough. Fleur's too young, he said. Oh, no, sir. We're awfully old nowadays. My dab seems to me a perfect babe. His thinking apparatus hasn't turned a hair. But he's a baronite, of course. That keeps him back. Baronite, repeated Soames. What may that be? Bart, sir. I shall be a Bart some day. But I shall live it down, you know. Go away and live this down, said Soames. Young Mont said imploringly, Oh, oh no, sir. I simply must hang around, or I shouldn't have a dog's chance. You'll let Fleur do what she likes, I suppose, anyway. Madam passes me. Indeed, said Soames, frigidly. You don't really bar me, do you? And the young man looked so doleful that Soames smiled. You may think you're very old, he said, but you strike me as extremely young. To rattle ahead of everything is not a proof of maturity. All right, sir, I, I give you our age, but, but to show you I mean business, I've got a job. Glad to hear it. Joined a publisher. My governor is putting up the stakes. Soames put his hand over his mouth. He had so very nearly said, God help the publisher. His grey eyes scrutinised the agitated young man. I don't dislike you, Mr. Mont, but Fleur is everything to me. Everything, do you understand? Uh, yes, sir, I know, but so she is to me. That's as may be. I'm glad you've told me, however. And now I think there's nothing more to be said. I, I know it rests with her, sir. It will rest with her a long time, I hope. You aren't cheering. 
said Mont suddenly. No, said Soames. My experience of life has not made me anxious to couple people in a hurry. Good night, Mr. Mont. I shan't tell Fleur what you've said. Oh, murmured Mont blankly. I really could knock my brains out for want of her. She knows that perfectly well. I dare say. And Soames held out his hand. A distracted squeeze, a heavy sigh, and soon after sounds from the young man's motorcycle called up visions of flying dust and broken bones. The younger generation, he thought heavily, and went out onto the lawn. The gardeners had been mowing, but there was still the smell of fresh-cut grass. The thundery air kept all scents close to earth. The sky was of a purplish hue, the poplars black. Two or three boats passed on the river, scuttling, as it were, for shelter before the storm. Three days fine weather, thought Soames, and then a storm. Where was Annette? With that chap, for he knew, she was a young woman. Impressed with the queer charity of that thought, he entered the summer-house and sat down. The fact was, and he admitted it, Fleur was so much to him that his wife was very little, very little, French, had never been much more than a mistress, and he was getting indifferent to that side of things. It was odd how, with all this ingrained care for moderation and secure investment, Soames ever put his emotional eggs into one basket. First Irene, now Fleur. He was dimly conscious of it sitting there, conscious of its odd dangerousness. It had brought him to wreck and scandal once, but now, now it should save him. He cared so much for Fleur that he would have no further scandal. If only he could get at that anonymous letter-writer, he would teach him not to meddle and stir up mud at the bottom of water which he wished would remain stagnant. A distant flash, a low rumble, and large drops of rain spattered on the thatch above him. He remained indifferent, tracing a pattern with his finger on the dusty surface of a little rustic table. Fleur's future. I want fair sailing for her, he thought. Nothing else matters at my time of life. A lonely business, life. What you had, you could never keep to yourself. As you warned one off, you let another in. One could make sure of nothing. He reached up and pulled a red rambler rose from a cluster which blocked the window. Flowers grew and dropped. Nature was a queer thing. The thunder rumbled and crashed, travelling east along a river. The paling flashes flicked his eyes. The poplar tops showed sharp and dense against the sky. A heavy shower rustled and rattled and veiled in the little house wherein he sat, indifferent, thinking. When the storm was over, he left his retreat and went down the wet path to the river bank. Two swans had come, sheltering in among the reeds. He knew the birds well, and stood watching the dignity and the curve of those white necks and formidable snake-like heads. Not dignified what I have to do, he thought, and yet it must be tackled lest worse befell. Annette must be back by now from wherever she had gone, for it was nearly dinner-time, and as the moment for seeing her approached, the difficulty of knowing what to say and how to say it had increased. A new and scaring thought occurred to him. Suppose she wanted her liberty to marry this fellow? Well, if she did, she couldn't have it. He had not married her for that. The image of Prosper Profond dawdled before him reassuringly. Not a marrying man, no, no. Anger replaced that momentary scare. He had better not come my way, he thought. The mongrel represented... But what did Prosper Profond represent? Nothing that mattered, surely, and yet something real enough in the world. A morality let off its chain, disillusionment on the prowl. That expression Annette caught from him. Je m'en fiche. A fatalistic chap, a continental, a cosmopolitan, a product of the age. 
if there were 